how many of you actually edit your photographs for school or for work or for some other cause? How many of you use Photoshop or at least uh, edit pictures, put them on social media? Not that many. How many of you know someone who's manipulated? Don't point. <laughs> I always tell people I don't care if you're carnivores or vegetarians, we're all media eaters. And we are bombarded every day, every minute, with some form of, of media images. Now, anybody who says that we don't like being deceived is lying. We love being deceived in many different ways, but we tolerate it. And, of course, magic. We go there thinking we're going to be deceived, and that's the challenge, is to find out uh, where, where the truth is. But used to be seeing is believing uh, ever since the invention of photography and ways of recording words and images, we have been taught to believe what we read and see. Now, we all know that's not true completely, but we're living in a different age where we've had a lot of different transgressions through the years. But the people, even hundreds of years ago before photography, if something was written down, we accepted it as the truth. So, in the digital age, with the speed of what, the way we can um, detect falsehoods, there's this shifting credibility and more reliance on the credibility of the photographer than the photograph. There's some great TED Talks uh, online about the new currency of credibility in the digital age, in the new millennium. We depend on credibility in general to succeed in business and in our personal affairs and just about everywhere. So again, I've kind of talked about what do we tolerate, are we part of the problem? Anybody who's used social media, we want to look as good as we can. And we usually do that through uh, either images online or when we pick out senior pictures, we choose with the photographer your best shots. Uh, there's nothing necessarily unethical about that. We value people's opinions, whether it's social media or wherever. But when they cross the line, I like the difference between manipulation and editing, and we say they're so judgmental. But really, it's the same concept. Ethics is, is the same in many other situations. It's like nailing jello to the wall. You know, sometimes you, you just have to find support for your particular ethical position, whether it's something as benign as taking a, a photograph that might not be real at the moment, but finding some other way that you could justify it. So I noticed or throughout history, and especially the recent history since digital, as technology has improved, as the resolutions have gotten finer and finer on cameras, on printers, the ethical boundaries have actually blurred. We're, we're much better off at detecting falsehoods, or everything happens on a much faster uh, speed. You can make a general correlation like this, and take it even one step further, in that as our, as our awareness has grown, the credibility of photography has gone down, which I've already talked about. Uh, this is probably one of the most famous problems that, that a magazine ran into. As soon as Newsweek and Time got a hold of the mugshots of OJ, they published them on the cover. Newsweek ran the, ran the shot pretty much the way it, it came into them. Time decided to basically editorialize it. They made it darker. Uh, they made OJ look guilty. And they tried to defend their position. They tried to say, well, we wanted to reflect what was overwhelmingly in the public's um, attitude about OJ. Uh, we don't feel we did anything wrong. Uh, but they lost a lot of credibility for this. Most people pretty much disagreed with Time's reasoning. But the issue that this brought up is how much manipulation is acceptable, again. You can't always explain away something on the inside pages to somebody who happens to see the cover. It, it raises the question of what is misleading. Is misleading bad? Can it be good? And one of the questions we go through in, in the media ethics class is, uh, is it okay to mislead if there's a greater common good involved? When is disclosure necessary? When should a, a, a media, a magazine, a newspaper, whatever is publishing for the public, disclose that they, they've manipulated, edited a picture. And this has gone round and round for decades. Because every time 
somebody comes up with a code of ethics or a, a proposal for the government to regulate the media, it gets shot down. It's, it's not in our constitution for that to happen. And many times, we need to know the truth. National Geographic has been guilty of the same thing. Um, this was their, their greatest transgression, lost them tons of credibility. Um, not only, well, the, the first photo is the original photo taken by the photographer, who, by the way, asked the camels to walk by and the camel owners to walk by again because he missed it the first time. So that part was set up. And then uh, the story goes that the, the issue for that month already had a cover photo, and it was a cover of the Dalai Lama. And I forget what the event was or why they were, they were profiling. But they received a lot of complaints from the Chinese government. A lot of, I don't want to say threats, but a lot of pressure to remove the Dalai Lama's face from their cover. At the last minute, they decided to remove the cover, and they're scrambling for another shot. They found uh, this guy's uh, Gahan shot. So they had very little time to put it all together. And they, they completely repositioned everything. They did everything uh, in their labs to make the, the horizontal picture fit the vertical format. Very hard to see on this one, but obviously you can, you can get a pretty good idea that there's been one or two camels in the front here. And they, they enlarge things and move them around, so you have the pyramids of the camels. True to the original concept, maybe, but not the actual shot. And my favorite defense that one of the editors gave was he said that we simply retroactively repositioned the photographer. <laughs> 1988, six years later, this was sh shot right in Portage Lake, Portage Glacier. A bunch of us were ticked off at this photo. It's not a realistic photo. They didn't, as far as I know, they didn't add anything or take away anything. But it is completely illegal to windsurf in Portage Lake. And at that time, the glaciers were, were very close, but you could not do that. So they were they were representing um, an activity that's that's not legal. Why they had to do it there and not a billion other lakes and, and rivers, I, I don't know. You have different expectations of truth in every media. You have certain standards that are very strict in journalism. And at the other end of the scale, with art, Anything goes, theoretically. Um, again, even with art, you wouldn't display certain things in, in uh, the Museum of Modern Art that you might in other places, or vice versa. Context is everything. Very much like learning a foreign language. Those of you who've learned a language or have been traveling, you miss one word, you can totally change the dialogue. It can be very funny at times. It can be very, very insulting. You have to be careful. So even with the context, you have to be aware of the cues, the clues, um, what, what you're shooting in, and the context of the display of the picture afterwards. And context does not have to be physical. This is what we're kind of learning now because we've had photographs around for a long time. Context can be temporal. It can have to do with time. We tend to think of, of just kind of a narrow frame of time What's it going to be like in the next week or two, or the next year or two, or three or five? But how about 40 years from now, 50 years from now? This is a, a pair of orphan kids. They don't know where the, fam the uh, parents, I believe, were probably killed during the war. Um, a little girl in the box, a little boy. This is on a bathroom floor somewhere in, in Vietnam. And the photographer, Chick Harity, snapped the shot. It engendered tremendous feedback from the public. Uh, orphanages were uh, getting calls all over the country for people wanting Vietnamese children orphaned from the war. He changed probably thousands, maybe millions of lives by the time you add up all the influence of these, these kids as they grew up. Forty years later, the photographer got a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Mr. George Bush is in the background. They didn't tell him, but they found the girl. And while he was talking, she walked up through the aisles all the way on stage. And that was the first time they got reunited after that time. They said there wasn't a, a dry eye in the, in the audience. But to be a photographer and have that impact, 
is life changing. There, you don't have to keep your head in the hole anymore. We've got media everywhere. Whether you live in a small town or in the middle of nowhere, you can access different forms of media. You don't have to be uh, limited to just the visual. Guidelines, engage your senses. There's other ways. Pretty soon, I think we're going to have ways of smelling and tasting online. We already have 3D printers. So there might be ways of us getting much more of a, of a multi-dimensional, multimedia experience beside what we're getting now. Explore your assumptions. Ask, what are you assuming about the photographer, about the situation, about the people in the picture? And if you remember Tron, uh, those of you that remember video games in their infancy, he was thrust into a video game. He was immersed in this multimedia dimension. And every one of his senses was engaged and heightened all the time. And that's kind of where we are here. And I hope that you can uh, use some of these guidelines and, and discern these things for yourself. So thank you for your time. We'll stay around for questions.